Hello, this is Zeus Sardu, and this is my presentation of Zeus Muse Fragrance Pharmacy, a perfume called Carly Kloss's American Rose. So let's get right into it. Um, how did I come up with the this perfume, American Rose, for Carly Kloss? Well, um, I saw her Met Gala dress, and I thought it was, well, the most amazing dress I'd ever seen. Um, a lot of Carly's dresses, she always looks great on the red carpet, but her dress is a little bit more indifferent, or she's better than her dresses. Um, but this dress was exceptional. I thought it was the, great, the greatest dress I'd ever seen. I thought she looked like the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen that night specifically. Um, and I guess I kind of got this idea for this painting here and from there I then came up with the perfume so a lot of the time I come up with a perfume concept prior to the painting but this was an exception to that um, as you can see it's an absolutely stellar painting at least it's a draft and I'll discuss a little bit more later on but I made some additions to it like these floral frames are on the outside of the dress I have her holding this bouquet. We have the, the ankle braces, the rose on the, the tip of the um, high heel here, the floral frames on the shoulders, just little things like that that I feel like really enhance the dress beyond its current already amazing design. And um, once I designed this dress, I'm like, well, why don't I just design a perfume called American Rose? I mean, that's a pretty easy concept to design a perfume around. So that's what I did. So this is the layout for the um, perfume here. And it's called the Perfume Template. I don't know if you've watched any of my other videos, but all of my perfumes have this universal perfume template. The, um, the visual art in the center, the background, the, the name, of course. And all the ingredients vary from perfume to perfume, but the template is more or less universal. Um, but uh, that's how I came up with this perfume idea. So. It all started with the dress, then the dress led to the painting, and then following that, I then designed the perfume. So, um, what are the themes of this American Rose perfume? Well, America, roses, and Carly Kloss. Now, I do recognize that some of the ingredients in here are not roses. You would think that with an American Rose, you know, named perfume, that there would be, like, all roses, for example. But, um, I don't know. There's 30%... Mr. Lincoln Rose, which is probably the most iconic rose that there is, it's heavily used in the perfume industry, and it's called Mr. Lincoln, um, which is the name, its name derives from the American president, which most Americans are familiar with, um, and, uh, but uh, as you look at it compared to like, let's say Blueberry, Blueberry is only at 5%, whereas American Rose is at 30%, so it still is a rose-dominated perfume, it's just that um, I didn't put rose six times to sort of compensate for having a higher percentage for this specific ingredient, but it still is a rose dominated perfume. And as you can see, there's the red, white, and blue color composition of the perfume ingredients, which was no accident, of course. I mean, it doesn't look like an accident, and it wasn't. Um, but uh, I'm very pleased with this perfume. I think it might be. I don't know about my best, but it's it's certainly a very iconic, classic rose fragrance. I mean, it's, it's it's hard to come across a perfume that is this. I don't know, kind of iconically perfumed for for, for a woman, because there's a lot of perfumes that I've designed, like let's say, um, American Cookie or K5, which stands for Queen Carly's Coffee Cookie and Cream. I just mentioned two other perfumes that I designed for Carly. And those are kind of, I wouldn't say they're niche perfumes, but they're not classically perfume in, in terms of their composition. Whereas this is a really, really classic American perfume that I think is very, very difficult to top. So perfume symmetry. There is one exception to perfume symmetry here, and that is the placement of these two. You have a fruit here and a flower here. Aside from that, all of the ingredients in terms of their genre are symmetrical in relationship to one another. So you have the two roses down here, symmetrical. The two female ingredients here, symmetrical. This is kind of like a like a triangle frame here of symmetry between the three different types of woman perfume ingredients. You have the two woods, symmetrical. You have the two fruit, symmetrical. 
I just like to lay things out in a way that comprehensively makes sense. Now, perhaps it doesn't really matter how you kind of lay in the perfumes because when you actually mix the perfume together, I mean, it, it's all going to mix together the same way. I mean, that's one of the interesting things about a perfume is that you have all of these different ingredients that you're smelling at the exact same time. So there isn't this sort of progression of different ingredients that you kind of smell through when you smell a perfume, but you kind of smell them all at once. But, um, um, I don't know. I just, I just like laying things out in symmetry. I mean, if you look at this painting here, it's obviously a very symmetrical painting. I think that all great paintings have at least a degree of symmetry. Thomas Kincaid is an exception to that, but, um, it's a great draft. I think it'll make a fantastic painting and, um, we could actually have Carly come in to do a photo shoot. Um, at the location, you might have to put these roses in place and like kind of build some things, like put these sculptures up and so forth. But it'll be an iconic painting for sure when it is finally finished, whether or not um, it's kind of a photography-based perfume with us actually building this landscape and putting these ballerina flagpoles in place, or whether or not we just paint those things into reality. Um, but it, it is a great painting, and I just like doing everything in symmetry. So... Uh, what is the perfume's color composition? I talked about this a little bit already. It's red, white, and blue, which makes sense because it's um, American Rose. I think that um, red, white, and blue is a really, really tremendous color composition that you can, you know, apply to a lot of th different things and have them be winners. A lot of different flags for different countries like France, Great Britain, America, Australia. There's a lot of different flags out there that have red, white, and blue just because it's such a stellar color composition. So... Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to go wrong with red, white, and blue because it's so strong. And um, I don't know, maybe I'm biased since I'm American, but I guess since I'm an American, I guess I kind of look at red, white, and blue as kind of American colors. So that's why I decorated this perfume template with colors that reflect the culture of the perfume. Now, it may seem sort of silly, again, to kind of go through the trouble of laying in perfume ingredients in a red, white, and blue composition, but when it comes to... The actual delivering of the perfume, I have in mind to actually have kind of the people who pay more for kind of a more high-end type service, a more luxurious service, to actually have each perfume ingredient kind of placed in a basket. And then you have at the center of the basket, you have the perfume bottle that is being sold to the individual customer or given to the individual, well, I guess it's sold or delivered to the individual customer. And it has all these different ingredients placed inside the perfume basket. And it's going to be a really, really stellar visual display, of course, because it's just going to be kind of look like a bouquet of a sort. But it's also relevant to the culture and brand of the perfume. So one of the things that happens when you start putting your color compositions in a way that comprehensively makes sense is that um, you can then take things to the next level when you're talking about marketing the artwork through visual art and bouquets and stuff like that. It's just, it's a really helpful device to, to do and that's why I do it. Yes, I, I probably would still do it with just the perfume template. But again, when you take it to the next level of marketing, of actually showcasing the ingredients with the visual display, it's a really helpful device. Um, the incomplete painting details. This is actually Secretariat. I don't know if you've heard of the Racehorse Secretariat. It's the American Racehorse. Um, widely, widely renowned as the greatest racehorse of all time. He's dead now. Um, I guess if you're talking about actually having Carly come in for a photo shoot, you might have to put her on another horse because that horse is no longer alive. But um, I just thought that it added a lot to the painting to put to actually have that painted in with him be with the horse be secretary and the super super iconic American painting with this kind of red roses field, red American flags. Carly Claus in this American rose um, dress and she's marketing this American rose perfume. Perhaps you could even put, <coughs> excuse me, you could even put um, this, uh, like a perfume bottle that she's holding right here, kind of right here on her her, her hip. I think that'd be a really helpful visual device. Um, but, uh, I don't know. The painting is just a draft at this point. And again, why, the reason that I have Boris Vallejo and Julie Bell, in spite of them not having anything to do with this painting, I essentially sent it to them to try to get them to, you know, be part of this painting or, you know, commission them to, to, to do this painting. I didn't get a response um, because I don't really I don't really have any connections at this point in time, but um, um, it'll be a great painting for sure. And uh, you know I think one of the greatest, most iconic American paintings of all time. I can't really think of any other painting that is quite like this. That's so classically patriotically American, 
and I think it'll sell really well. As you know, it's like prints in people's homes. Um, just because Carly's a really friendly, well liked person, well liked star, really beautiful, and it's just a really classic American image. And so anybody who puts red, white, and blue stuff or decoratives in their home, perhaps might want to add this to their home as a kind of a an artwork to add to their to their home. So yeah. Um, what perfume ingredients are most dominant? Well, I've already mentioned this a little bit. Michelle Lincoln's Rose is at 30%. JFK Rose is at 20%. So you have two American presidents, again, the, the American theme of the perfume. Um, breast milk, if you're dealing with Carly, Carly's own personal perfume, I think it would be ideal for her to actually have her own breast milk in her perfume. Now, why would a woman want to put their breast milk in their own perfume? Well, it's kind of like advertising their own fertility in form of a fragrance or, you know, girls kind of wear skimpy outfits that kind of highlight their breasts because they want attention, which is fine. I endorse that, but it's kind of a way of doing that through fragrance, I guess. It's kind of advertising your fertility, which uh, I think, you know, most girls are interested in that sort of thing in terms of, because it's, it's not only like to attract a mate, but it also affects your social status in the world too. So, um but uh, most of the other ingredients are all like 5%. So none of these appear are very dominant. The ovulating sweat and the ovulating cream are only at 2% too. And as you can see those, all of the um, numerical amounts are symmetrical in relationship to one another. That's another attention to detail in terms of symmetry. And I just think it makes sense. It's, it, again, it's really helpful to lay things in symmetrically in terms of genres and colors and stuff like that. Because when you take things to the next level of actually applying perfume ing ingredient amounts for each essential oil, it just makes sense. So, um, why did I add Mr. Lincoln Rose to this perfume? Well, again, um, Mr. Um, Abraham Lincoln was an American president. Um, he's one of the most beloved presidents of all time. And uh, he has a fantastic rose that is named after him. I think that Mr. Lincoln might be the most renowned red rose in the world. Um, it's very renowned for its fragrance. It smells like lemons and very heavily used in the perfume industry. So that's why I added it. But I also added it because it was red and I wanted red, white, and blue colors to dominate this perfume. So now why did I add JFK rose to this American rose perfume? Well, JFK is, again, another American president. His rose is white. There were, um, I could have added a Marilyn Monroe rose to this perfume as well. The reason that I didn't is because that's a yellow rose, and I didn't want to add yellow to this color composition. So that's why I didn't do that. But um, it would be ideal for this to have been in a white frame. But again, symmetry, I guess certain things I kind of balance out and say, well, I can make this white, but then that kind of messes up the red, white, and blue color composition. So And it messes up my symmetry in relationship to the two perfume ingredients. So I sort of sacrificed putting this in a white frame. I, don't, I, I think it still works. So, yeah. Uh, why did I add blueberry to this perfume? Well, I'll just go ahead and mention, this is getting a little bit ahead, but every single perfume ingredient, aside from frankincense and myrrh, is native to the New World or Northern America. And there's a reason for that. Perhaps some of it, well, the apple is not. The apple grows naturally in America, but it is not a New World um, flower. Now, perhaps the Honeycrisp apple is an American brand, but um, it's not necessarily, you know, the apple was not a new world fruit that was discovered by, you know, Christopher Columbus or whoever was, you know, kind of labeled as being the discoverer of America. But blueberry and cranberry are both completely indigenous to America, the, the Americas, the new world, northern America. And that's why I had cranberries and blueberries. And of course, they smell delicious and Carly likes both. I haven't heard her, heard her say anything about her liking cranberries. I like cranberries a lot, actually. I haven't heard read anything online about Carly actually liking cranberries, but um, it's due to the color composition of red and blue, too, that I added these two, and, which, of course, makes sense. I mean, I could have added, like, I don't know, um, strawberries as opposed to cranberries, but strawberries are not indigenous to the New World. Cranberries are. Um, I could have added, let's say, banana. Um, I, I don't really know whether or not banana is indigenous to the New World. I don't think it is. I think it's indigenous to India. But I could have added banana, but the reason I didn't is because it was yellow. So that's why I didn't. Again, I've already mentioned why I added cranberries to this, so we're just going to jump past this. Why did I add the Honeycrisp apple? Well, 
Again, it's red. It's red in color. I didn't want to add a green apple, of course. Um, it's, um, it's an American brand, or um, they were the the breed was created in America. Carly also loves apples, so that's one of the reasons why I added apples too. Apparently, it's her go-to fruit, and there's a good reason for it. Apples are really are really really hardy fruit that last for a long time. Um, they're easily transportable. I don't know. They're just they're just like a super fruit, basically. So can't go wrong with an apple. Now, why did I add blue hydrangea? Well, because it was blue. I could have added a wide range of other flowers. I need. I could have added another fruit here, but the problem is there isn't really another fruit that exists. I don't know. I could have added like the damson fruit or the damson plum, but I didn't do that. I ended up going with um, hydrangea, which perhaps throws off my entire um, genre symmetry. But um, I liked adding another floral fragrance because I wanted to create a really quintessential feminine perfume and I, I every time that you kind of substitute um, a fruit for a flower you kind of lose some femininity um, I mean I think that fruit is still kind of feminine I mean how many men wear kind of fruity colognes like none but um, the flowers are definitely more feminine than fruit in my opinion and they're more classically florally they're more classic iconic perfumes when you add more floral ingredients so that's why I did that why did I add white vanilla? <clears throat> well, because vanilla is, I don't know, for symbolic reasons, of course, it's, it's white. Which I needed a white perfume ingredient. Um, Carly is an American white girl, and I think vanilla is kind of seen as, like, white. Like, just like people kind of see chocolate as kind of symbolizing black people, or at least some people do. I've done that in other perfumes that I've designed. So, for example, I put chocolate and LeBron James cologne just because he's black which uh, hopefully they don't demonize me for I mean I, I did the same thing for Carly I mean I'm just commenting on the color of their skin and what race they are I'm not saying it's a bad or a good thing I'm just saying you know this is kind of us mental associations that people make when they think of vanilla you know like vanilla ice people called him vanilla ice prior and that's how we came up with it with his stage name vanilla ice because he's white as in the midst of all these you know black people so that was kind of part of his stage name. So I, I think it works. Why did I add ovulating sweat? Well, because um, they've done studies, scientists have done studies that um, in, say that men are more attracted to female sweat when they're ovulating. They find women more attractive and their sweat more attractive while they're ovulating when they're not ovulating. And um, I guess if you're talking about creating a perfume, a perfume for a celebrity, like there's Carly is, you know, the dream girl type fantasy for a lot of men. And um, I think that, uh, I guess, I am I personally would be jealous of men who know her scent. You know, who have been in the bedroom with her. I think a lot of other men would, would, would be too. But I just thought it would be interesting to add ovulating sweat. It's not in a high amount. And of course, it's going to be more difficult to actually harvest that being that a woman only ovulates once a month for a few days, and a lot of the time she's on the pill too. So it's it's gonna make it more difficult to to um, put that in there. But let's just move on to the next one. I think the next one really proves my point as to why I added human ingredients to perfume. And the next thing is ovulation discharge cream, which is at two percent. The reason that I added ovulation cream is because I think that um, ovulation cream is the real aphrodisiac as it relates to the human species. The reason that we don't really think that is because we're, we're constantly wearing clothes and showering to cover up our scents um, so that we kind of, in some ways, sort of desexitize ourselves so that we smell more, I guess, gender neutral. We put on perfume, which the mental associations that you make with different types of perfume isn't necessarily masculine or feminine. Like a rose isn't really feminine. Like, yes, the mental association that we make is feminine. Um, a, a masculine perfume is kind of trying to smell like more like the rawness of nature, like woods and stuff like that, whereas a floral perfume is kind of going after something different. Um, it's kind of like this sweet, supple, kind of delicate type of fragrance. But objectively, um, a flower isn't really male or female. It's essentially an asexual reproductive plant. Um, whereas, so if you're talking about what is a female ingredient, well... 
you know, I suppose a rose could be seen as a feminine ingredient if you're talking about perfume. But milk is probably more feminine than, let's say, a rose because only females produce milk. Now, we're so familiar with milk and we drink it all the time that we don't really make that mental association. But it is something that is real um, in, in the sense that it is some, milk is actually a real female ingredient that is only particular to women. But if you're talking about creating an aphrodisiac, an aphrodisiac that really is an aphrodisiac, I think you have to put ovulation cream in there. Now, I don't think that um, ovulation cream is the male's reaction to ovulation, cre ovulation cream in the humans is anywhere near as pronounced as, let's say, a polar bear or really any other animal species on the planet. Um, the smell of an ovulating female typically causes the male to kind of lose their mind, starve themselves to death and go to the female or try to mate with the female and then battle to the death with other males in order to mate with the female. Um, but uh, that is not as pronounced in our species. But they have done studies that indicate that there are surges in testosterone when men come in contact with an ovulating female or smell an ovulating female. And so I guess I just think there has to be something to it. Um, if every single animal species on the planet has such a strong reaction to the smell of an ovulating female, why would it be so much different for humans? So that's why I put that in there. I, I suppose it is kind of experimental to put that in there. And it's going to be, you know, difficult to actually harvest that ingredient because women only ovulate once a month. And a lot of the time, they probably won't even want to give up their ovulating female ovulation cream. But if again, if you're really trying to create an aphrodisiac that really is an aphrodisiac, I think you have to put ovulation cream in there. So that's why I put it in. Why did I put breast milk in? I've already mentioned this already. I, I feel like a woman wearing breast milk is kind of like wearing her fertility as a fragrance. And I think that when you start adding all these other real, you know, zesty, you know, inv invigorating perfume ingredients like rose and apple, you're kind of like spicing up your own breast milk to make it seem even more fertile than what it actually is. It's like, you know, you're making it seem like you're even more fertile than what you are. Not to say you, you can possibly be more fertile, but it just makes you seem even more supple and sexy and fertile in just every possible way. I'm telling you, like if Taylor Swift walked into a room and a man, all the men in that room knew that she was wearing her breast milk in her own perfume, I assure you, every single man in that room would want to smell her. I'm telling you, they would. They would. I guarantee you. So, why did I put frankincense and myrrh in? Well, that's kind of a thing that I do with all my perfumes. Um... I think frankincense and myrrh are non-American ingredients. They're kind of um, Middle Eastern ingredients that aren't really relevant to an American perfume. I guess, I suppose, if you're talking about frankincense and myrrh from the biblical perspective, most of America is Christian or Christian in belief. And for that reason, I think that it could be seen as being American, like a form of Americanism, as opposed to going to China where it's not really a terribly Christian nation or continent or... I guess it's a nation, but um, that geographical area is not, I don't know, it's not terribly Christian, so it's not really relevant in that context, but um, the reason I added frankincense and myrrh is because of the biblical passage, the three wise men brought gifts of frankincense and myrrh to baby Jesus, and I see myself as having a very muse-driven personality that kind of thrives on giving gifts to, you know, people that inspire me or women that inspire me. And I feel like every single perfume that I create, as much as I have something fiscal to, you know, or financial to profit from, to, you know, personally from, um, I see the perfume as a gift. Like, I'm the, I see myself as the greatest perfumer in the world. And if I create a perfume for someone, I expect it to be stellar and completely customized to them personally and fitting their own culture and brand. And I, I you know, if they don't say thank you, I, I'd be kind of, you know, disappointed, um, just because I put a lot of work into it, and I'm the best in the world at what I do, so I, I see kind of what I do to be an act of gift giving, and I kind of thrive on creating works of art that are named after muses, I guess. Um, I didn't really understand that about myself for a long time, that I had a very muse-driven personality that likes to create things for muses, or a muse often inspires my artworks. Um, but that's the reason why the company is called Zeus Muse. Um, not only do I have a muse-driven personality, but secondly, 
Um, I like to create things for muses. It, it just pleases, like my personal way of being wired as a human being thrives off creating things for people. Kind of a Santa personality. That's why it says from Santa's um, frankincense to Jesus' myrrh. It's kind of like a Jesus, Jesus thing. I don't know. But just a marketing you know, title that I put on there. But that's kind of why I add frankincense and to each one of my perfumes. And it's also a branding thing to know that um, each one of my perfumes is going to have frankincense and myrrh in each and, one, and every one of my perfumes. So um, the per perfume conclusion and verdict, I don't know. It seems like every single time that I create a perfume, I'm like, oh, this is my best perfume. But that's just, that's just because I created it recently. It's typically whatever one I'm working on that's like I get really excited about. But being that I just finished it, this one or re-edited it and relayed it out, I'm very pleased with it. And um, I really hope Carly likes it and wants to do business with me because I think it's undoubtedly, in, at least from my perspective, more clever than any other perfume out there on the market. And the only other competition that it's going to, to have is other perfumes that I've created personally. So, so, so far as I see it, it is the best perfume in the world. Um, there might be other perfumes that can kind of compete with its fragrance. Um, just because, I don't, that's a complicated argument. But with, it, with that, I'm just going to leave it here and kind of end this video and hope you enjoyed it. So, thanks.